Hey, what's up everybody? It's Dan. Hope you all had a happy holiday and a refreshing new year. But I gotta be honest, 2021 still feels a whole lot like 2020 so far. I was all set just about to submit my latest review. Using Natalie Ironside's fantastic novel, The Last Girl Scout, is an opportunity to gently needle some of my favorite targets. When the darndest thing happened, Trump pulled one right from the source material, which goes well beyond what a lot of people thought he was actually capable of. It's quite upsetting to see a Confederate flag being carried on our national capital. I don't know that we'll ever be able to look at the Gadsden flag the same way. It's a dark day. The power of words is important, and in the wake of this mass misinformation scam the president is running, people are dead. The sanctity of our nation's democracy has been violated to circumvent the will of the people, and the use of force has been leveraged to motivate political change. This is the kind of craziness I've been worried about coming for some time. President Trump must be removed from office. But unfortunately, after being emboldened, the crazies are off the leash. And in the vacuum, Trump will leave when he vacates office, by choice or by force of law. Something new will come along to rally them. Just remember to look out for one another. Offer one another the security, respect, and dignity that all human beings deserve. Except Nazis. Fuck Nazis. And Confederates, too. Well, back to the task at hand. For context, I've been rereading The Road with the same manic energy people watch The Office with, just for that little kick of serotonin I get when the man and his son find that fallout shelter. In month, what is it, nine of quarantine, everything is starting to feel a little stale and recycled. Just staring at the same walls as depression closes in on me. So imagine my enthusiasm when I found something new and shiny in a sea of white noise. The Last Girl Scout by Natalie Ironside stands out. I love this book from the first chapter. Anarchists scavenging the American exclusion zone are pinned in between a radiation swell and a horde of zombies led by a Nazi. I would have been happy if that was the entire book, but things only escalate from there. The Last Girl Scout is probably the best thing to come out of 2020. A year so fucking bleak and grimdark it's become an honorary member of the 41st millennium. The book is fantastic, but it may be a bit of a niche title. It's a post-apocalyptic action-adventure story. It's openly leftist. It's gay. It's got women as prominent action adventurers. I'm into this. There's a fair amount of allegory to decode, and the book moves lockstep with a lot of my own values. But that's not really the full appeal. Let me try and capture the feeling. The year is 1987, and I just saw Slayer for the first time. I'm baked out of my mind, lost in the parking lot trying to find my friends. I'm starting to get the fear when this woman I've never seen before lures me to her Ford Fairmont on the promise of a chocolate milkshake where she proceeds to vigorously take my virginity. This book kicks ass. But the book is not perfect. I wouldn't put it into the same category as, say, oh, I don't know, The Invisible Man, a novel routinely considered to be one of the best ever written. But I'm an optimist. The book is fun. I like to have fun. The tone of the novel is sincere and authentic. I think in part that comes through because of the gravity of the themes contained within the book, which includes racism, transphobia, and sexual violence. It's all conveyed with a good dose of humor, depth, and heart. Looking for a touchstone? Let's roll the clock back a few years. Sense8 was one of my all-time favorite shows. I would have loved to have seen it go on for a few more seasons. The show has action and adventure and twists and turns aplenty, but the functional science fiction element is that the protagonists are Sense8. I won't spoil the show because it's fantastic, but in functional terms, the plot device allows for compassion to be addressed as an assumption, not as a hurdle to be overcome. For the serotonin deprived, the human connectivity is probably the most appealing part of that show. Now, I initially enjoyed The Last Girl Scout in context of the genre triumph, but I gotta be honest, I put in the work, I did some research, and came to really appreciate the book as a pretty sophisticated study in compassion executed with a high degree of technical competence. Aside from doing this review, I can think of no more praiseworthy thing to say than to note that as soon as I finished reading The Last Girl Scout, I immediately started writing my own highly derivative, yet legally distinct, work that I will probably never, ever finish. The story is great, and the choices are really unique and refreshing, and run parallel to some personal agendas of mine. I mean, I like guns, and I really like the complimentary leftist angle. And I really like the treatment of trauma within the novel. While a novel can be enjoyed face value as a lot of fun, it's educational, insightful, and it's written with a substantial dose of authenticity that I really enjoyed. But as usual, all of my conclusions are wrong, so read the book yourself. There's a lot to unpack in The Last Girl Scout, so let's get going. Now, I've done a couple of video game reviews, so if you've ever played a video game in a post-apocalyptic world, you get the setting in The Last Girl Scout. If that sounds tropey, you're right, and it's fucking awesome! The novel contains all of my favorite beats, archetypes, and plot devices jammed into a tidy package. 
Zombie, apo nuclear, apocalypse, summary, execution, getting the team back together for one last score. This time, it's personal. The hunter becomes the hunted. Chekhov's gun. I'm in too deep. Did I mention there were vampires? <laughs> yeah, better throw that shit in too. If that sounds derivative, you're wrong. The amalgamation is delivered into something entirely new. It's refreshing. A lot of this is made possible because of the novel's overtly leftist perspective and the prominence of traditionally minority characters. The novel exists at a bit of an intersection. The genre seems to change from post-apocalyptic fiction to horror to dystopian future without any abrupt departure in the story. The book has a nice Lord of the Rings feel to it. Lots of walking, history songs, food and drinks, camaraderie, then war councils. Things are very comforting until they're broken up with a visceral knifing. I seem to recall that I did say to Peter, have you any idea of what kind of noise happens when somebody is stabbed in the back? And I said, because well, I do. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not, ah, no. like that. It's <gasps> because the breath is driven out of your body. He proceeded to sort of talk about some very clandestine part of World War II. Oh my god, Count Dooku was in the SAS? Holy shit. The geometry of the plot allows all of those settings to be amalgamated into the story with sincerity. Ultimately, the plot is pretty straightforward. There's a call to action, there's a quest, there are consequences to be managed. The Last Girl Scout leverages a lot of World War II archetypes. There's a MacGuffin and Nazis stand in the way. A tale as old as time, wholesome really. The writing has a lot of clarity, which allows the story to be pretty big. I'm impressed with the volume of content contained within a standalone novel. The plot is well constructed and ramps up deliberately, the stakes are clear, and the pacing's a bit off in a few places. There's maybe one too many plot hooks, but all the hooks are correctly baited in a clear way and executed competently. Characters are unique and identifiable. Introduction of characters is handled very well and paces out the story well. The cast of individuals is definitely executed well and is one of the strengths of the story. Now, I read a lot of apocalypse fiction. The Road, Lucifer's Hammer, The Road, Alas Babylon, Swan Song, The Road, A Boy and His Dog at the End of the World. Classics. Now, the apocalyptic fantasy is fun, and it's fun to let it infiltrate your life a little bit. Soup for the Family makes sense, and suspicion of government and corporate interests is fine. But some people can get kind of carried away with it and take it to an uncomfortable place. Y you know who I'm talking about. I'm a Texan, so I don't really have any problems with guns or anything, but there's been a weird tone shift in apocalypse fiction lately, and yeah, I'm, I'm gonna blame libertarians. The post-apocalyptic genre is different from the survivalist genre due to the addition of a particular political outlook, but they do commingle in places, and these books, being media, are an odd reflection of their target audience. Now, if I had to identify the most toxic, easily triggered fandom out there, well, well I'd have to pick Doctor Who fans. But a distant second would have to be survivalist writers. It can be fun, but predominantly, the survivalist genre is super right-wing, insert self here, self-gratification. There's usually a guy on the cover that looks like he should be occupying a federal building in Michigan. You see a lot of this low-effort shit on Amazon. These authors spend a lot of energy constructing a narrative with a plausible end-of-the-world scenario that showcases the virtues of survivalism, where the calamity can be survived by the prepared, and the drama can be resolved with an AR-15, because obviously, re recycling initiatives and shit like carpooling is just, just way too gay. But it all generally follows the same format. Event comes, wise right-wing white man is some dispassionate, hyper-rational Vulcan whose Ouija board told him to get ready. He was blessed with the material resources to prepare. At the end of the world, he is transformed into an action hero and uses violence to shoot the apocalypse and defend his homestead. There's usually a scene where the unprepared gets what's coming to them, and it serves as a validation of the whole survivalist thing. It's also rational and devoid of human emotion. It just reeks of people who have been shattered by living in a zero-sum game so long they think that they're winners when they rationally prepare for the system to come down upon their heads. Case in point, Patriots, which is legitimately one of my favorite books, and is probably the grandfather of the survivalist genre, written by Rawls. The calamity showcased in this novel is a treasury bill collapse. And it's not really a novel, it's more of a how-to with a lot of Red Dawn thrown in. In summary, some potato farmers end up fighting off the entire United Nations, and I love every page of it. But that doesn't come from a sincere place of admiration. The book is just so full of weird shit, it gets a little too close to advocacy in a few places, like leveraging legal loopholes to construct improvised explosive devices, and illegally converting civilian weapons into full automatic. In the novel, they mount weapons on civilian aircraft for close air support, 
and use homemade thermite to destroy an entire Abrams tank company, a vehicle noted for its nearly invulnerable combat record. There's a lot of insincerity in that literary expression, and the conceit of rational and imminent threat is completely fraudulent, at least so far as it's an expression of wealthy white men protected by legal privilege. Which means that their literary output is fantasy, but to justify and reinforce the survivalist mandate, it's expressed in completely rational terms that I find totally off-putting. And considering that the target audience may not be able to tell fact from fiction, it may potentially be dangerous. First, the whole survivalist thing is a commercial activity designed to shield participants from the end of the world that commerce is making inevitable. Nested in that is the faulty assumption that everyone has equal access to participate in capitalism. It just plays right into the commodity fetish. In summary, it's the desire to carry wealth and power forward into Armageddon. So there's a lot of strength and power fantasy in there. Secondly, the idea of the homestead fallback location is not a shared fantasy. Retreating to the amniotic safety of America's agrarian bosom doesn't appeal to everyone equally. For some reason. Third, the fantasy of the dissolution of physical safety isn't a fantasy for some, particularly those communities marginalized by capitalism. So there's a lot of colorblindness nested in the foundation of that genre. And you know what the missing thing is? Beyond the weird conceits that are lazy, recycled, derivative, and redundant excuses to use violence to solve problems, the missing thing is the recognition of personal vulnerability. And the communities and individuals represented in The Last Girl Scout are absolutely vulnerable. If only there was a safe place for left-leaning individuals to learn community and personal protection in a venue that was separate from the right-wing toxicity of the gun community at large. The Last Girl Scout is incredibly refreshing in this regard, as a departure from some of the toxic virtues showcased in right-wing apocalyptic fanfiction. Without missing out on the fun and adventure of a military-style apocalyptic fantasy, the novel is aware that it is an apocalyptic fantasy. The leftist perspective is incredibly refreshing, and every attempt has been made to come up with a diverse cast of underrepresented characters that feel unique and have plausible arcs. I really like the leftist perspective in the book. Transposing Soviet-style communism to an American setting is new and inventive. Secondly, it's possible to interpret this book as a synthesized on-ramp to leftist theory, and it's still compatible with Nazi villains, but it's a new approach to get there. To this day, communism and socialism retain a lot of stigma. And sometimes, in my private places when I'm alone, I start to get the feeling that there are people out there who would gladly accept fascism as a reasonable protection against anything that smells socialist. That's the strength of indoctrination. So, if you've got a Punisher sticker on your car, that leftist perspective would probably be enough to ruin the book for you. You know, if you were literate. But I think a lot of readers could just accept this as a fantasy sci-fi setting and run with it. It's weird that in the U.S., leftists have to move delicately to define their agendas, while there are literal fucking Nazis out there. I'm not saying that romanticizing the Soviet Union to Westerners is impossible, but it takes a fine touch. But it probably works best in a World War II setting. The Soviet Union lost something north of 20 million people to stop the fascists and there's a lot of human sacrifice and heroism involved in that side of the war. There's a lot that goes into repackaging American communism and making it distinct. Just to give an example of this, first, and this should be immediately apparent, is the open acceptance of homosexuals and trans people. The leftist state in the novel has no barriers in place to gender expression, which is quite removed from the vile behavior of the antagonistic fascist state in the novel. And this is great in the context of the novel, but the status of homosexuality hasn't always been so protected in communist Russia, made remarkably worse under Stalin. In the book, the communists are literally trying to rebuild the world. Patriotic heroes dual class as botanists while proud boys smoke meth. The communist state in this novel is the champion of the oppressed, which just makes me happy. This book gives a lot of insight into a marginalized community. This goes beyond token representation and paints really clear pictures. There's a lot of time and energy put into gender dysphoria, which I think is handled really well. Going back to the writer's golden rule of show, don't tell, this is handled masterfully with really solid anecdotes that are increasingly relatable. Now, the perspectives explored in this book are interesting. It's a new perspective, explored in a new way, which is refreshing, and the novel gets points here. But it requires a careful approach or else you get into fetishization. The book is careful not to introduce minority representation in terms of novelty or tokenism or anything that feels exploitative or reductive. Before reading the book a second time, I spent a lot of energy conducting research and educating myself. Ultimately, I believe this is the point of the book. My conclusions here are my own, but it's about the complete individual. Good art makes you think. That isn't to say good art needs to spoon-feed insight to the audience. Step out of your comfort zone. Challenge your ego and your prejudices. Put in the work and emerge with a more thoughtful, less shitty version of yourself. Fetishization of marginalized people is avoided with two elements being handled with sincerity. 
One, the characters in the novel are treated as unique individuals, not caricatures to be lampooned. Second is the assessment of their individual trauma. The status of marginalized and oppressed people's quest for justice are valid. There is no quantum of insight or understanding that is required to make justice accessible. Compassion is not a commercial transaction that requires two parties, one receiving compassion on a faulty condition of insight or understanding. And when compassion is treated as a privilege to be gifted by those in power, trauma occurs. Now, my hatred for J.K. Rowling predates her transphobic rhetoric, and I'm glad that TERFs have replaced Stitches as the internet's easiest target. It's a satisfying step as far as low effort virtue signaling goes. J.K.'s exclusionary diatribe is doing real and measurable damage. She's given a very prominent platform to legitimize false and dangerous rhetoric that removes the victim's access to human dignity. This isn't some Game of Thrones style in-universe character betrayal. It's more like if the creator of X-Men, a metaphor for racist police practices, gave a few million bucks to Blue Lives Matter. But my first beef with JK is that her shitty books about children confronting their parents' murderers is notably lacking in the way trauma is addressed. Sure, there's some token nods or whatever, but those kids should have been incredibly fucked up chain-smoking alcoholics by the third book, and Harry even sooner considering the abuse in his home during his formative years. The absence of well-researched trauma reduces the book to a collection of colorful images and all-too-convenient plot contrivances. It really could have helped the audience be more trauma-informed as they move into adulthood. Instead, the world gets a bunch of no-value internet quizlets about what your Patronus is. I claim that I coined the phrase trauma ballad in 2017 while I was writing The Iron Gift as a direct response to this failure. I also claim that I coined the phrase social justice operator, but who cares. I would absolutely call The Last Girl Scout a trauma ballad. There's a dialectic enigma in the expression of trauma in literature. As a literary exercise, you're trying to define the shape of a thing you aren't looking for only by the shadow it casts. This puts the audience into the role of trying to diagnose a character's symptoms in order to anticipate their motives. There's a divergence between the perceptible and the underlying root cause. Furthermore, while discussing the traumatizing context of needing compassion, empathy, and unconditional support, what can be seen on the observable layer may not be so sympathetic. It's a very interesting literary exercise to work through, trying to shape negative space. But again, it serves the ultimate purpose of helping the audience to be more trauma-informed. But I really appreciate how trauma was handled in this book. If it's too subtle, the audience misses the point. And if it's too overt, you've just got some stock bad boy detective with a personal vendetta who drinks too much and doesn't play by the rules. Putting it all together, The Last Girl Scout is a good book that I think is worth your time to read. It's not for everybody, but it's fun, it's well-written, and it's got meaningful content filtered through the lens of a unique and valid perspective. There's a lot out there competing for your dollars, so I'm going to make my book free for the next few days to make it easier to purchase Miss Ironside's novel. I'll pin the links below in the comments. Make sure you like and subscribe. I'm going to let Miss Ironside nominate the next book for review.